So far in our water series, we've explored cohesion, surface tension, capillary action, and adhesion. And now it's time to take a look at what happens when water gets cold. I change my behavior depending on the temperature. When the environment is cold, I put on extra layers to insulate myself. When it's warmer, I wear fewer layers, and if it's really hot, then I use barriers to protect myself from the sun. Water changes its behavior based on temperature as well. When the temperature is very hot and water is above its boiling point, then the molecules zoom around really fast and they're very far apart. As a liquid, the water molecules are closer together, they're still tumbling about and moving quickly, but they interact with each other through hydrogen bonds. When water freezes, something incredible happens. The molecules slow down and they become organized. Everybody line up. A beautiful lattice structure forms. And to create this pattern, the molecules need to spread out. And this is why water expands when it freezes. It's why ice floats. It's why snowflakes are six-sided. And it's what allows us to do the five investigations in this video. If I put solid water into liquid water, it floats. We've seen this so often that we take for granted how unusual it is. Most substances, if you put the solid form into the liquid, it will sink. Let me show you with a cube of frozen oil. Do you see how the oil sunk straight to the bottom? Because it is a solid, the molecules are packed tighter together. It's more dense and so it sinks. In ice, on the other hand, the molecules have spread out to make that crystal structure. And so they are less dense than the liquid. But what do you think will happen if we switch things up? What if we put a cube of frozen oil into the water? And what if we put an ice cube into the oil? Remember, if you mix oil and water, the oil will float. It is less dense than liquid water. Ice also floats in water, but solid oil sinks in oil. Keeping these things in mind, what do you think will happen if we put an ice cube into oil or if we put an oil cube into water? Pause the video, make a prediction, and then start it up again to find out. An oil cube floats in liquid water and it will keep floating until it melts, forming a layer of liquid oil on the surface. With the ice cube, it all depends. This ice cube was very wet and had started melting it hovered in the middle of the cup for a few seconds, but then it sank. As it melted, the ice cube started to rise. The drops of liquid water would fall to the bottom, and then the ice cube itself would slowly go upward in the cup of oil. I put another ice cube into the same cup of oil. This one was not at all melted. It was completely solid, and it floated very well. So it's a close contest. The buoyancy of the oil and ice are very similar. So sometimes when you try this experiment, you'll get something like this, where the ice cube hovers and as it melts, it creates a bunch of little beads of water at the bottom of the cup. This ice cube floated until it got so small that the weight of the melted water dragged it down to the bottom and then it disappeared. This ice cube from an ice machine sank when it was placed in canola oil. And another ice cube from an ice machine hovered for a bit but then sank when it was placed in soybean oil. But then these ice cubes that were made in an ice cube tray both floated. That is, they floated until I gave them a little nudge to get a better view, and then one of them sank. The second ice cube eventually lost its air bubble, and with a little nudge, it started to sink, but it didn't quite ever make it all the way down to the bottom. And there you have it. An oil cube will always float in water, but an ice cube might sink or float in oil. It all depends. Frost wedging is a type of weathering caused by water. Many rocks have small cracks and fissures in them. When water gets into these small cracks and it freezes, it can expand and actually break the rocks. 
All of the smaller rocks you can see that make up this dry riverbed were formed by weathering, and frost wedging was a big part of that process. In this investigation, we will recreate frost wedging using plaster as our rock. To do this investigation, you will want a container, balloons, and plaster. To have a control for the experiment, you can fill up a balloon with oil, but this is tricky to do. And when you place the oil-filled balloon in the freezer, nothing happens, so I would recommend skipping that control and just using the water balloon. Each of these has a small water balloon inside. They have dried for two days now, and they are very hard. To show you just how hard this plaster is, I'm going to smash a can, an aluminum can, with one of our bricks. Ready? There we go. The can is completely smashed, and you really can't tell that the, the rock was hurt at all. It has a few, few round marks on the bottom, but is essentially undamaged. So the question is, is water strong enough to break this rock? If I freeze these, will they crack? I just took our plaster out of the freezer, and they have cracked. So on this one, it cracked around the bottom, and on the side, it actually broke this whole section off. And you can see there's another part here, whoops, <laughs> this is ready to come off. So the balloon definitely broke this one. This larger one, it cracked down the side and along the top, and then the balloon popped out a section on the bottom and the balloon itself broke and ice formed. And then our last little plaster mold had a crack, but it had not really broken as impressively as the others. And I was curious about what it looked like inside. And so I took a hammer to it to help that initial crack become a big one. And there we have a little cross section of the balloon. And of course the balloon itself is frozen solid. So there we have it. The incredible power of water when it freezes into ice, that force of it expanding is strong enough even to break rocks. After being in the freezer for two hours, this soda was super cooled. It was below the temperature where water freezes. So as soon as it contacted the ice, it began to freeze. Oh, there was a small ice crystal in the neck of the bottle. And when the liquid touched that, it caused the rest of the bottle to freeze before I could pour it out. Here's how it works. When water gets close to its freezing point, the molecules want to start that crystal structure, but they need help getting it going. The situation is kind of like penguins on an iceberg, where nobody wants to be the first one to jump in the water. You go first. No, you go first. But as soon as supercooled water gets that signal to line up, Everybody line up! Then it will freeze very rapidly. And that signal can be a lot of different things. It can be ice, impurities in the water, or a jarring movement. Regular water freezes at 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But salt water freezes at a lower temperature. And because of this, something really neat happens when we mix salt and ice. The temperature drops. It's dropping because melting water is a process that actually takes energy. When you add salt to ice, the energy for that melting is drawn from the ice itself. And so the temperature will temporarily drop down to negative 20 degrees Celsius or about zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperature that salt water freezes at. And we can use this drop in temperature to do a very neat demonstration. Get a matchstick or a toothpick or a piece of yarn wet, put it on an ice cube and sprinkle it with salt, and the temperature will drop below the freezing point of water. So if you wait for just a few seconds, new ice will form and you can pick up the ice cube with the match or a toothpick, or a piece of yarn, or a ribbon, or anything else that you can lay across the ice cube. But of all the things to use, matchsticks are my favorite. In my experience, they work the very best. Let's see if it works with a big one. So I put my, put my stick on. Sprinkle on the salt. All right, it's been, a, it's been about a minute. Let's see if it worked. Look at that. Behold the power of thermodynamics. 
I'm holding up a big heavy chunk of ice just because I sprinkled salt on the block and that lowered the temperature and froze ice to the stick. So cool! To make ice cream in a can, you just need two cans. Coffee cans work well. A one pound coffee can for the, the inside that the ice cream will go in, and then a larger number 10 can for the, the bigger one. You could follow any ice cream recipe you want for this activity, but I'm going to show you how to make a vegan ice cream using just three ingredients, coconut milk, dates, and cocoa powder. Put between 7 and 10 dates into your coconut milk and add a heaping tablespoon of cocoa powder. Then blend everything up and taste it to see if you want to adjust the ratios at all. Mmm, tastes really good. Use duct tape to make sure that the lid is securely sealed over the small can with your ice cream in it. Next add salt and ice to the large can and use tape to secure the lid. Now roll it around for about 10 to 15 minutes. As the ice melts, it drops the temperature, keeping the ice cream nice and cold, and all of the movement incorporates air into the ice cream, giving it a great texture as it freezes. After about 20 minutes of rolling, our ice cream is done, and it is delicious. Yum. Because of the ice, the can gets very cold, so you won't want to hold on to it too long. You'll want to pass it quickly from one person to the next. When you take it out, if you shake it and you can hear it sloshing around, it's not ready. But if you don't really hear much sloshing around, then it's time to open it up and check on the ice cream. Ooh, look at that. So see how it's sticking to the sides now? If you like your ice cream soft, it's ready now. If you would like it to be firm, put it back in the can with salt and ice, roll it another 10 minutes, or put it in the freezer for 20 minutes. If you don't have cans, then you can use plastic bags instead. And don't forget that there's a free foldable book that goes along with this video. It has instructions for all of the activities that we just did, and a little bit more about why water freezes. And now it's time for book recommendations. Yay! We love books! This month I'm sharing with you my five favorite books about princesses. You've probably noticed that a lot of picture books about princesses portray very passive, flat characters who sit around waiting to be rescued. Well, what I love about these is that they, they don't do that. Um, the princesses in these books are dynamic and interesting characters, and they have a hand at shaping their own destiny, and plus the stories are just flat out outstanding. I love these, love these books. So, Princess in Black by Shannon Hale is wonderful. I love the whole series, but number three, The Hungry Bunny Horde, is my favorite. Then The Paperback Princess by Robert Munch is a classic. I loved this book when I was a kid and have enjoyed reading it with my own kids as well. I love Cornelia Funk and her Princess Knight and Princess Pigsty books are wonderful. And Interstellar Cinderella by Deborah Underwood is fabulous as well. So if you haven't seen these before, check them out. They are all wonderful books. And that's it. Work hard, grow smart. I'll see you next time. No way. After so many of them didn't work, this one worked and it was when I had the bad lighting. <laughs>